Welcome to Spotlight. I'm your host, Ryan Keating. Joining us today is one of New York's finest singers, a woman who is best known for her performances in Berlin to Broadway with Kurt Weill, for which she received an Obie nomination, as well as the Maltby Shire Review, Starting Here, Starting Now. She can be heard on both original cast recordings, which are now collector's items. She recently appeared in the 15th anniversary revival of Jacques Brel as Alive and Well and Living in Paris, and received accolades for, for her performance. And now singing from that show and demonstrating how she has a rare ability to touch the human heart is Marjorie Cohen. old 
Marjorie, welcome to Spotlight. That was Richard Bauer on the piano, very talented. Um, it's a real pleasure to have you here. Oh, it's lovely to Your be here. Your work has touched really. so many people. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an interesting story. Um, you recently appeared in the 15th yeah. anniversary revival of Jacques Brel. Robert Guillaume was asked to do that revival, and uh, he had done the show many years ago, and mm -hmm. he said he couldn't do it because he didn't have the fresh anger that it took. But you have also appeared in that show when you were in your early 20s. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that there's been a change in your performance? Well, um, definitely. Any good music allows you to grow with it, I think. And uh, I, it was nice coming back to it after, my God, the first time I did it was over a decade ago. It was about 14 years. And uh, it's so beautifully written. I mean, each is a little story and the mood is so wonderful and you can bring so many moods to this music and uh, now as a woman in her 30s I'm, I'm finding all new things in, within the songs so it was really lovely to do. What do you think makes uh, Brel appeal to so many people? Oh he was a, he's a fighter, he was a fighter when he passed on, um, on a few years ago. Um, every song was a protest song, I mean this about aging, about the, the, the a war, he was very anti the Vietnamese war, he wouldn't come to the United States mm -hmm. until after the war was so-called over. Um, and uh, so every piece in the show was just filled I mean, was with vitality and uh, I think it's just the human experience. They're very, the lyrics are very specific and everybody somehow finds themselves within there. It's, very special. Because you had performed the show in Chicago as well yeah. as in South Africa. Mm -hmm. Do you find that um, in such diverse communities the response is still the same? Well, actually in, in South Africa it was interesting. I was reluctant to go there but I figured this is my only chance to go there. It was 1974 before there was television in South Africa and I'm sure it's quite different now. Uh, people there were so naive, um, so insulated, and that show was an enormous hit. Um, we had audiences composed of people who were supposedly on house arrest. They weren't really allowed out of their houses. These were liberals who just adored the show and would come back. And one person approached me the first week. Uh, this woman said that she had organized a traveling troupe of people into the the homelands uh, where the coloreds, that's what they're called, and the Indians mm -hmm. lived, and asked if I'd be interested in joining them on a day off, and I was very excited about it because that was one thing I really wanted to get as involved as I could, being an American, it was difficult, but I never heard from her again, there was no way, I just, it was evidently quaffed. Because uh, one thing, when this fir show first opened uh, at the Village Gate, it was considered to be very political and it got very negative reviews as a result of that. Yes, yeah. I don't know if it was because of that. It was just very strange. It was the first show of its type. This really was the, the first super review. And, and I think a lot of reviews pattern themselves mm -hmm. after this show. And um, so I don't, I don't know. Yeah, it's true. It was, a, it was a 1968. It was a volatile time. How has it helped you to grow as a performer? Um, it, well, this music, I came in so fast. I'd been touring with Fiddler on the Roof and came home to Chicago on, on Christmas vacation. And uh, my mentor, 
Hans Wormann was the music director of Jacques Brel, so I went to see it, and he said, you know, we have an opening, do you want to do it? And I went, oh my god, I, I was dying to do it, and Robert Guillaume was in it then, he was fabulous in the show. So uh, I learned the show, I was still on the road with Fiddler, and then I, I left after six months, it was, I guess, in April when I joined the show. And uh, I just got away from the. What did you say? You said, "How did this help me grow?" grow? Oh, it's really <laughs> well. It just. Uh, I went on very fast when I um, first did the show, and uh, it's it's a very difficult. It's a very emotional show, and it really wears you out. And everything else looks like a piece of cake after doing the show. Now, Eric Blau had seen but, you at this point in Chicago? Yes, he saw the show, I guess it was a few months into my run in it, and we, after we closed, it was about a year after I joined the cast, he asked me to come to New York with it. And so I joined the New York company in 1970, and I've been here ever since. And how did you first find New York, having grown up in Chicago? Um, at, well, I had been to New York many times. My folks had a clothing store and came to New York to buy, and we had relatives in New Jersey, and so I, I would often visit as a, a kid, and I always, that was my dream, to move to New York. But once I was here, I, I, it, I was quite discombobulated. I couldn't believe I was actually living here. There was a, a kind of, I was stunned for a few months. It was strange. Mm -hmm. And then I don't think I really made a commitment to the city until after I was through with Brel and had been out of... New York for a while. I toured around Europe and uh, for a few months, and then finally decided now I have the energy that I need to cope in this city, and so I finally settled down, had my share of sublets, and finally got an apartment of my own. Well, that's always difficult. Oh. <laughs> well, now it's totally different. Mm -hmm. you know, really How do you is. find the city now? Do you still oh. are you still that excited about it? No, I'm not. I uh, I'm ready to leave. Uh, physically, more than emotionally, I think I, I can picture being out of the city in a year. I'd like to get property in the country, upstate New York or, or New England, and start some kind of a, um, a complex of uh, performers and artists of various kinds. I have a lot of friends and that uh, in different disciplines that uh, to, uh, basically to start an artist commune. I, it's just a dream at this point, but it's something that... Oh, I think a lot of people yeah. have oh, that dream, I think so, so too, you shouldn't yeah. have any trouble. But, uh, but coming back to Brel after, yeah. uh, after 14 years, do you find that the 14 years that you took to actualize yourself as an adult, that you draw <laughs> on personal experience oh, for this greatly. revival? Yes, well now, what happened with, uh, about three years ago, is going, uh, I was getting my BA finally after about 35 years, no, actually it was uh, after many years since I'd left the University of Wisconsin. And I didn't really want to leave the city. I also had started a relationship with somebody and um, I didn't really, I had had enough traveling. I had toured with Fiddler for a while and all these various shows and it was out of my system. So I, but it was very hard to stay in the city. There just isn't as much work mm -hmm. as there used to be. It's. Um, so I answered an ad in the Times for gardening work because my neighbor uh, has a terrace and she often goes out of town on business and has me, she asked if I would take care of her garden and I suddenly fell in love with gardening. So I decided if I'm going to do something that's not in theater and I really didn't want to do something related to theater for another job. I wanted to grow with something completely new. So I became an open space developer in uh, Clinton, which is Hell's Kitchen area in Midtown Manhattan. And that I now I'm working with the food co-op uh, with homebound senior citizens. And so when I first sang that song, after working with these people, we have about 30 people, mostly mm -hmm. senior citizens. I, some of them are homebound, but they are younger. But I would say almost 95% are senior citizens. That. Um, I, I first sang that song and it was incredible the, how it, it came so much closer than it ever did before. I mean, the, I always loved the song, but suddenly I saw faces in front of me. And, um, and, and in fact, right before the show closed recently, I, we, my partner and I in the food co-op uh, brought some of the people, about 10 of the senior citizens, to see the show. And I was worried about them seeing old folks, and they loved it. And 
I don't know why I was worried. It was, well, it's such it was a wonderful that, song. There's something very comforting about Mr. Blount's yeah. lyrics. Yeah. Oh, he did a beautiful job with lyrics. Really so having uh, taken yourself out of the theatrical world and gotten a, a regular job, mm -hmm. so to speak, mm -hmm. right. how did that change your perception of your well, career? Well, I, I was very, goodness, I, I was quite spoiled. I'd never had a non-theater job. And suddenly, after many years in the theater, and I'd worked constantly in Chicago and uh, and in the city, I uh, it was great. It really was. It gave me a totally different viewpoint of of the city and of what I want to do with my life and how I want. To, I feel much more of a part of a community now. I work also with children, um, teaching cooking and um, gardening in Midtown Manhattan, and it's incredible. And I've started to sing, too. I've sort of integrated okay. everything, and it's become intergenerational, and so it's very exciting. And I, uh, goodness, I get overexcited totally, and so I'm totally on a tangent, stop me, but uh, I, um, what was your question again? How it made you grow as a performer. <laughs> How did it make me grow as a performer? <laughs> We're back to that. Well, I, I think it has, I think, uh, um, that, as I said, uh, involving myself in a community, and I, I just, the, my partner is um, a man who has nothing, he's never had anything to do with theater, and we ride in a van on Wednesdays, that's mm -hmm. our delivery day, and this was the most amazing thing, the first time we delivered to the senior citizens, he would cut across Times Square at a quarter to two. You don't do that on Wednesday. No, and I couldn't believe it, I said, Timmy, why are we, why didn't we wait, there was no hurry, we could have done a reversal of the deliveries, and he said, why, and I said, well, do you realize it's crowded because it's matinee day, and he had no idea, and he'd been doing it for a year, and it was so, it was, it's very strange, because he's a totally different world, and it's like being in the twilight zone in midtown Manhattan, because the people that I now deal with in Clinton have been there, uh, there's one woman whose family was born, her parents were, mother was born in her apartment over a hundred years ago, she's now 85, and they don't, this is, it's a totally different world from two blocks east, and uh, it's fascinating, really incredible, and there's a real life there that most of the city is just not aware of, and it's pathetic that mm -hmm. it's being slowly taken away with gentrification. I'm becoming more politicized, too, and it's going into my music more, into my choices of songs, and my one-woman show, I'm just rambling on and on and on, but anyway, my, <laughs> <laughs> my one-woman show, you know, I'm getting very, I'm, as I, I go to, you know, my late 30s, I'm, I'm finding that my upbringing as a woman, you know, it's just so strange that, that uh, now I, I'm working on a show about women inventors and inventive women, and I'm finding these wonderful stories unearthed of, of women who nobody knew existed, mm -hmm. who should have been in the history pages. And, uh, so you feel you're becoming uh, more politicized? Yeah, definitely. Do you consider yourself a feminist? Or I do, yes, but I, I, yes. Why not, sure. And but how has it helped <laughs> you grow as a performer? Um, well, when I was working on Starting Here, Starting Now, we dealt with songs that Richard Malpey and David Shire wrote in the 60s. They sort of went through their trunk and just put together mm -hmm. some sh songs to do at the Manhattan Theatre Club. And most of them were so sexist that uh, there was one that Lonnie, they wanted Lonnie and I to sing called Still Single, about two women sitting on a shelf waiting for these guys to pluck at them 30? down. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, oh, it just, uh, I don't know, it was, it was amazing, and then it took a while, it finally took saying, I won't sing this, it just doesn't have anything to do with, you know, the 70s, I mean, it, it does, obviously, but it was strange having to battle, and, and everybody, nobody, you don't think, you have to go through a layer, you know, before you realize what is actually being said, and I'm much more conscious of what I sing now. It's much more important to me, everything, and I'm much more selective. Do you think that's because you've actualized yourself as a performer? Um, actualize? What do you mean by that? Well, you've come into uh, your own, that I you're... I guess so. You I'm can still draw on your experiences. I feel like I'm really right at the beginning of a whole new... And I'm coming out of the cocoon into something totally different. 
another show that you're very well known for is Berlin to Broadway with Kurt Weill. Mm -hmm. And uh, you had sung on German television with Lottie Lenya, who... Yeah. She was incredible, very helpful during the show. Uh, it's been said that she's very critical of people singing vile, in fact. Yeah, she was. It took a long time for them to get permission from her to do that show, and she only gave permission be so she wanted to coach it, so that was the only way she would give permission if she could coach it. And uh, so it was, it was very interesting when we recorded it. Um, she sat in the sound booth and they, instead of giving us notes between songs, you know, over the uh, microphone, she would come out of the sound booth and approach us and she walked very slowly. She was in her late 70s at that point. And I know that I'd, I sang My Ship and then they said, Lenya wants to talk to you, Marjorie. <laughs> and she'd come towards me like, oh. and I think, ah, what is she going to say to me? But uh, no, she really was very, she said to me it was her favorite song that Kurt had ever written and uh, she said just sing it simply. I think I was getting totally o over, I'm getting this totally overwrought and uh, but uh, it was, that music is so incredible. Again it's such incredible theater music. And it has such substance. Oh, yeah, I feel like I've really, um, and the two composers, Viol and Grell, have helped me in other music community. Well, one thing that those shows don't really give you the opportunity to do is show your sense of humor, mm. which we all know you have. Oh. <laughs> uh, you used to jump out of your parents' closets. Oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> they both died of heart attacks. It was really <laughs> sad, but no, actually, that's how I did start. I was very, it was the typical story. I was painfully shy as a child, and I, but I loved to sing and I loved to perform, so I would dress up in their clothes and just hop out and, and sing. I learned music so quickly, and so they started me in voice lessons when I was 10. Ironically, the first time I sang was in front of uh, senior citizens in a nursing home, and I felt like it was something I could really give. It was a gift that... Well, it seems that circle uh, sort of completed itself. It's funny. I hope this isn't the end. I <laughs> but... <laughs> um, no, you just have to move on and get your house in the country. Oh, boy. <laughs> As an actress, in a field where there are more women than men, how do you uh, deal with relationships because you're constantly on the go? Well, I've been with the same person. He's a, a freelance writer for almost five years. And um, we're stationed here, but we both definitely want to, to move out but keep the tie here. And I, as I said, I really didn't want to leave the city, but I, want, I didn't want to just sit and do uh, something that I didn't allow me to grow as a person. Um, but it is more, it's, it's difficult. Um, it's a hard city to live in. And um, I don't know, I don't know what will happen in the next year, but I think there's gonna be major changes in our life together. But we were lucky to get the apartment that we did. I had lived in the building for mm -hmm. 10 years before I met him, and uh, we found a one bedroom in the same building, and it was 69th Street in Columbus, which oh, is not possible. And I really don't like that area anymore. I, it's, it's just too much. I mean, it's packed with people now. So I'm really ready for a change. So uh, how do you hope to accomplish that? Um, well, I'm working on a one-woman show that I hope to book into universities, and uh, that would enable me to live anywhere. I'm also am writing with a writing partner, a show that Richard and I did together of tin types. Uh, Karen McLaughlin and I are writing a show, and we're hoping to, we just got word that somebody wants to produce it in Washington. And uh, I'm also working with some friends that I met when I did Three Penny Opera in Boston. That was also through Eric Blau and Ellie Stone. Um, and that would be a, an oral cassette, something that um, we just started working on. These are all things. We all have the same dream of getting mm -hmm. an area, maybe land, that we can have a theater center and have people come and write and perform and whatever. But um, 
So I think it will happen, like you said. Eventually. Well, Marjorie, it's been it's been a pleasure, this and we it, wish you it's a we wish you the best of luck, and we do <laughs> enjoy you your too. stopping by today. This is Ryan Keating, and you've been watching Spotlight with guest Marjorie Cohen. Hello. If you have any comments or suggestions, you can write to myself and care of Perro Productions, 640 10th Avenue, New York, New York 10036. Until next week, this is Ryan Keating for Spotlight. Well, for an ad lib, that was. Welcome to Spotlight. I'm your host, Ryan Keating. We're very pleased to have with us today a poet and playwright of international renown whose works have never failed to touch the audiences who are fortunate enough to experience them. He's written several books of poetry, the latest being Let Me Tell You About Moses. His plays, including O Oysters and The Cockeyed Tiger, both of which starred Ellie Stone, have received rave reviews. However, he's best known in the theater world for his wonderful translations of the musical review Jacques Brel is Alive and Well and Living in Paris. We're very delighted he could stop by and share his insight to the beauty of his work. Please welcome Eric Blau. Mr. Blau, welcome to Spotlight. Thank you. Your most recent show is, um, which it's billed as a rock collage, and it's entitled The 104 Bus. Yes. Now, this is something you consider a work in progress. Yes. We've been playing with it. I've been working with a young composer. His name is Elliot Weiss. He's Juilliard educated, which didn't stop him at all from being talented. He uh, works for a living. He has a lovely little family and has a, a little band that goes around and plays uh, bar mitzvahs and mm -hmm. things like that. But he's very, very gifted, and I was very happy to get to know him. And although his range is very wide, his love, since he is just 30 years old, is the conditioning of his musical childhood. It's rock. And uh, we contrived this. But the 104 bus is important 
to people who live on the west side because it's that great bus that comes out of Harlem, turns south on Broadway and goes over to 42nd Street where it turns east and it winds up at the United Nations. So the bus is, if not a living symbol, certainly a General Motors symbol and freighted, therefore, with meaning. <laughs> We've tried to do something with that musically. Well, you've considered it a symbol on an allegory. Yes. And when did you get the idea to write this? Well, not to shock anybody, but at Fire Island, <laughs> where there were no buses. Uh, uh, you know, the idea presented itself more or less because uh, one doesn't do too much thinking on vacation, or at least one tries not to, but this idea presented itself to me and I found it very attractive. And I spoke to Elliot Weiss about it and uh, he wanted to do something, and we did something. And now, it, as you said very correctly, it's a work in progress because. Uh, we learned a great deal by presenting it at the bottom line. You never know what a work is until you do it, but it's the creator doesn't anyway. Well, one thing I was very interested when I saw it, the audiences are from five years old to somebody's great-grandmother. What was their reaction to it? Well, uh, I think it was something like this. The people under 30 liked it very much, but they were not sure what it was about. The serious composers and musicians who were there liked it a great deal because they thought they knew what it was about. Then there was a, oh, a large section of the audience that simply said, what is this about? And uh, I appreciated all of those attitudes because I too was trying to find <laughs> out what it was about. And I think I did. So now we're doing some more uh, we're going to double its length, and the bottom line is going to represent it sometime this fall. Well, that sounds terrific. One of the things you've said is that your first love is poetry. Yes. And when did you start writing? Oh, that's a terrible question. Well, I would say I was about six years old. My sister tells me. I have an older sister. And she tells me that I began to write when I was about six years old. Not write, really, but to say things. And I would say things in very brutal rhyme. And she remembers that. So I imagine that was the beginning. I began to publish professionally when I was 15 years old. That means I wrote material that uh, adult journals found good enough to publish. Did that surprise you? Did you find that success frightening? Not frightening, I, you know, but it was very exciting. Uh, you cannot imagine, or perhaps you can, if you can take all of those volcanic adolescent emotional formations and suddenly have someone like Richard Wright say, that's a wonderful piece, Mr. Blah. Wow, that's, that's the whole world. You're living in a, in a place that's so rarefied you cannot believe it. So that, uh, so writing was really a part of my life almost from the very beginning. And well, these, I enjoyed it. these poems had been translated into French not long after they had been published. Uh, many of them have. Many of them have by leading French poets. Yes. You had served in the army in World War II. Yes. And uh, how has that changed your outlook on, on your work? I don't know, frankly. You know, the Army, World War II, it's a big, chunky experience. I spent four years in the Army. And it's certainly a very huge experience. And I don't know if I've digested it even until now. It's very hard to put those pieces together because a war is not something that should be done to people. And it's very, very difficult to know what happened.